know if uh, Brian Jastad is here today. He's not. So if he's not here today, I can't uh, read uh, a message, a wonderful message he sent me yesterday concerning the epistemologies of the South. Maybe we can uh, down to that uh, later on. I hope to be a bit uh, less polemical today than I was yesterday, I guess, uh, by trying to uh, discuss with you some of the ways in which I think that by creating a certain distance vis-a-vis -vis the Western critical tradition, we gain a lot. The world gains a lot. And we, the people in the West, also gain a lot. We don't waste as much experience as we have been uh, wasting. Of course, in order to do that, it's very demanding to create a distance. All the people that have done, managed to do that in the past, they were the ones that first became very, very familiar with that tradition. And it is not easy. Because it's a tradition in which you have to master several languages in order to get it, over several centuries. And therefore, many people take as Western modernity a slice, a very short slice of it. And very often a caricature of the Western modernity, as it was developed by people that were critical of it. And they didn't know it very well. The most important criticism of it come from people that were very, very familiar with Western modernity. And some of these that were so familiar with Western modernity were the ones that felt the need to go beyond. Look at Schopenhauer and the Hinduism. Look at Spinoza, 17th century, Machete, and all the others. Now, just to tell you about some, and we could even say about all the great thinkers, Newton is a very good example in this respect, not to say of the Enlightenment people. So it is not new. It is now necessary because we have to decolonize social sciences. That's the task. I have been inviting you to do that. We need really to decolonize our social sciences because I think that as our universities become more global and you get people from all over the world, <coughs> our colonial assumptions become more detrimental to them. If we receive Chinese students here and keep teaching them that the Industrial Revolution is an European exceptionalism, we are doing a bad service to that culture. Because otherwise we won't understand why until 1830 China was the prominent country in international trade. If we have African students here and tell them that uh, philosophy started in Greece, then we are not telling them that in fact started in Africa, North Africa, and that the first university was not Bologna, but Al Azhar in Egypt and Timbuktu in Mali. If you have students here from the Arab countries, and teach them about Max Weber, Marx, and Durkheim. I have nothing again. I've done that for ages, I would say. I'm not telling them that one of the most important writers, more relevant for the world today, and then, is Ibn Khaldun. Much more probably than, than, than Max Weber for our time. And if you are receiving students from Latin America, probably they will never know the real name that the native people put to that continent of, of theirs, the one, the continent before the conquest, Abiyayala. Or some of them will know just because it is the name of a publishing house in Quito. <coughs> so it will take long, would take long, to go on on the different ways in which you can decolonize social sciences. But now let's look first on what we can do with key concepts, and as I told you, we have to understand the tradition very well. And I have to tell you a kind of a, is a personal thing, but it's a very, very important thing at this point in my life. I'm having a very fruitful debate, a very rich debate, with a great French philosopher, Etienne Balibar. 
It so happened that we ran a course together at the Barbeck College at the University of London last June. We got in love. Uh, we really started a discussion. You can imagine an Aristotelian specialist, an Aristotle, a specialist on Aristotle and the theories of citizenship, having a discussion with the type of questions I'm going to raise here about citizenship. And it was possible, because it is possible sometimes to do intercultural translation within the same tradition. Uh, and I think that this debate, we are going probably to continue this debate in, Quimbra, in Lisbon next summer under a dialogue, and we'll show, and I hope to show here, why the ones that know very deeply the Western tradition are the first ones to think that we have to go beyond it. Because they have seen all the holes of these constructions, particularly when, as I say, the Western-centric world is shrinking. And as it shrinks, its universalism becomes more ridiculous. So let's see then what we can do by using, as I said yesterday, that in fact we are at a, a junction in our time. Sometimes I say that it's either too late to be post-revolutionary or too premature to be pre-revolutionary, pre pre-revolutionary, because in fact we lack nouns and we need some adjectives and we need the counter-hegemonic use of certain nouns, and one of them is citizenship. The other is the rule of law, and the other is human rights, and the other is democracy. But we have to exercise an hermeneutics of suspicion, as I said yesterday, vis-a-vis -vis these concepts, if you want to use them. For instance, let's take, uh, even though I'll start with citizenship, let's do uh, an exercise with human rights. If you exercise this hermeneutics of suspicion, vis-a-vis -vis such a universal currency as the human rights are today, we have to come to three or four ideas. The first one is that by far most of the population of the world is not a subject of human rights. It's an object of human rights discourses that we produced. The second one is that lots of unjust human suffering does not count as a violation of human rights. And in fact, some violations of human rights are ventilated and are denounced in order to hide other much more serious violations of human rights. Fourth, that many violations of human rights have been committed in the name of human rights. As much destruction of democracy has been conducted in the name of democracy. As much civilian life has been conducted under the name of protecting civilian life. So the final idea is that we cannot expect that whoever has been oppressed under the name of human rights will one day become a defender of human rights. And sometimes our surprise in certain regions of the world is our difficulty to accept that people have many, many other differences, very other experiences, and very uh, opposite to our experiences with human rights. So, before entering into human rights, I have to go with the citizenship rights. Why with citizenship? Because we have this duality uh, since 1648, in fact, and then with the French Revolution between the, the rights of the citizens and the rights of the of the humans, right? Like the Declaration of, of why was that? Well, it came from 64, uh, 1648. As you know, the 1648 is based on three principles. The first principle, of course, is sovereign states. Everybody knows that. But uh, the second principle is established religions. For the first time, we are going to have so Austria is going to be Catholic, the Netherlands is going to be Calvinist, and England is going to be Anglican. So established churches. And third is rationality as uh, the geometrical rationality of Cartesian principles against all the other concepts of reason, like the concept of reasonableness uh, that used to be dominant in the 17th century. 
So these principles are going to create an unprecedented thing, is that people can only be citizens of a given country. This is unprecedented. Not before. Before people, in fact, were citizens or part in the same way of the different countries in Europe, and uh, I'm talking about Europe, that's what I know, but probably in other regions of the world. And we know in the colonial, uh, in the pre-colonial Africa or Latin America, these peoples were transnationals. The Incas, the Quechuas, the Aymaras were transnationals because before they, they became nationals. We know that. So, if you look at that, you can see, therefore, that in our time, the concepts that we are going to analyze to define citizenship are divided on this idea that there are people that have some more rights than others because they are citizens of a given country. And so human rights became a second tier of rights because, in fact, most important rights would be the citizenship rights. And, in fact, for many people today, what we say that the, why the human rights are such a, a wide currency today in our world is because there is a crisis of citizenship rights, particularly of social and economic rights, because they are not under the aegis of a given state. So, having this in mind, what, is, what can we say from the perspective of the epistemologists of the South of a post-colonial concept of citizenship about these concepts, about these ideas, about citizenship, quite frankly. Well, the first idea is the following. From a post-colonial point of view, the only adequate perspective to analyze citizenship is the perspective of the non-citizens. We have to start with the non-citizens. Because, in fact, even though all the liberal theories concerned with the inclusion of more and more citizens in the social contract, seen from this perspective, all the liberal system is a system of more exclusions than in inclusions. And very, very pervasive ones. And therefore, we have to talk of citizenship based on the non-citizens. In the liberal mode, citizenship, of course, is a, an institutional status that defines a specific way of belonging to a civic nation, nation in terms of a very privileged space, which is the nation-state space. So, and this is belonging to a, a, nation, a civic nation, which is one concept, among others, of nation, because there are also ethno-cultural nations, but this is the civic nation, that's the one that lies uh, at the core of the liberal theory, this uh, belonging is based on a double political obligation which liberal thinking has developed very, very sophisticatedly as the vertical political obligation between the state and citizens and citizens vis-a-vis -vis the states, which is run by the state, and the horizontal, cities, or horizontal obligation, citizen to citizen, which is ruled by the market and by the civil society. And these are two, well, the, 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 the core distinction in law, in modern law, derives from that. Use public law, use private law. Public law, private law, comes from vertical obligation, horizontal obligation. They belong together, and they belong together through a metaphor, a very crucial metaphor, a root metaphor of modernity, which is the social contract. All of these people, all these, these two obligations are within the social contract. In light of these assumptions, we are going to identify in the liberal theory, if we look at the liberal theory of citizenship, on the basis of these hermeneutics of suspicions, which is only possible because I developed this distancing from that tradition yesterday, you can see that there are three major types of non-citizens. And these major types are the following. The non-humans, whose inclusion would be unthinkable, the subhumans, whose inclusion would be dangerous, and the discardable or dysfunctional humans, whose inclusion would be unnecessary or inconvenient. Concerning the non-humans, of course those whose inclusion in the social contract would be unthinkable, 
are those that are the non-humans, therefore they are non-humanic, and they are based on two criteria that they are non-human. One is the existence, existence criterion, and the other is the incommensurability criteria. The existence criteria says that the only humans are the living humans. Dead humans, dead humans, or humans to be born are not humans, are not part of the social contract. Therefore, past generations, future generations are not part of the country. They are not living. So that's the first. And it is very clear in the liberal theory how this is organized. It's because the, the theory, you read that in all the liberal theoreticians from Locke, Hobbes, and then Rawls, above all, of course, is the symmetry between rights and duties. We cannot grant rights to whom you, from which you cannot demand duties. I cannot demand duties from past generations. They are not alive. I cannot demand the duties from the future generations. They are not here yet. So this symmetry prevents them from having rights. But there is a second criteria, and this criteria is the incommensurability criteria. That is to say, non-humans that are either incommensurably superior to humans or incommensurably inferior to humans. The incommensurably superior to human is God. The incommensurably inferior to humans is nature. And these two, of course, cannot be part of the talk of rights and duties. They are absolutely behind that. In fact, they may be available to us, to humans, in a very easy way. And in fact, liberalism is going to define two forms of privatization through which these incommensurably superior and incommensurably inferior are made available for us. These two forms of privatization mm -hmm. is private belief and private property. Private belief for God, private property for nature. Therefore, secularism is for God what property is for nature. The second kind of uh, non-citizens are the non-human, are subhumans. Those that are unfit for the symmetry between duties and rights. They don't have really the qualities that would allow them to be, in fact, fully responsible for their rights and their duties. They are subhuman. And in fact, as I told yesterday, as I mentioned yesterday, <coughs> along the history of humanism and Western <coughs> modernity, there is always a category of subhumans. May change over time, but there is always a category of subhumans. And what distinguishes subhumans from the others is that they are neither individuals, as the individual liberal, not active collectivities. They are inert collectivities. The most resilient forms of the subhumanity have been the colonial and the women. For very different reasons, they are the most resilient forms of subhumanity. In the case of the colonial, I told you yesterday about the abyssal thinking. Apparently my papers have not circulated but uh, the paper has, are published and you can read there what I mean by the Ibiza line and why I think on the other side of the line is the colonial and why the colonial is invisible is the area of non-being. You can also uh, read uh, Franz Fanon in which you can see the same, in fact, uh, influence, uh, lots of connections between this abyssal conception and Fanon's conceptions of the zones of non-being. Um, so it is this colonial that is going to see the entity to whom the rights and duties of liberal citizenship cannot be applied. Because they are, as I said yesterday, they are belong beyond regulation and emancipation. They belong to another area, appropriation and violence. They are to be appropriated, they are to be victims of violence, but not for rights. And therefore, our universal principles don't get compromised by the fact that they don't apply to them, because they are not fit for the so our universalities, universal principles, are always based on the idea that some people are not fit for them. 
So it's not the, the fault of the principle, it's the fault of the people. As I said yesterday, the colonial is not gone. <clears throat> the colonial is today in our societies. And I think that the two forms that I mentioned yesterday, uh, the terrorists and the undocumented migrant worker, are, since the colonial in our time, as groups of people to whom the principles of law, they can be executed extrajudicially without going to international criminal court because the laws don't apply to them. And of course, racism and war on terror and imperial military intervention and the migration of repression now so violent in Europe is part of what I call the neocolonialism. The other, of course, is subhumanity of the women, which is much longer. It's a longer duration of it. And what we have to analyze is the specificity of this subordination under capitalism. And it is very specific and it's very well analyzed by our colleagues feminists and I'm not going to uh, dwell into that. Of course, it develops their labor power to begin with uh, by two uh, 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 different mechanisms, by the, the work they really do and by the way in which the labor power of the man is devalued by the unpaid labor usually performed by the woman is not paid. So there are different forms through which you can get an extra exploitation out of, of this type of subordination. There are others, but in any case, just to, to <coughs> see. So what, what we can see is that this, these subhumans, in this case, these subhumans have been struggling. And, uh, and uh, all the movements, feminist movements, decolonial movements, anti-colonial movements, indigenous, peasants, etc., they have forced the abyss line. They have made themselves visible. And uh, by that, they have, in fact, gained rights of citizenship and inclusion, even though the inclusion very often is exclusionary. That is to say, it's not in their own terms. And very often, it's not rever irreversible. They are the first to get fired. They are the first to get unemployed. They are the first to get out of the system. The third kind of non-citizens are the humans whose inclusion in the social contract is not necessary or convenient. And uh, therefore, it's a different kind of exclusion of non-part uh, of the system, because they are not part of the contract, not because of what they are, but because of what they do. It's to say, they are the ones that are dysfunctional or discardable population, as the, I think it's still the current president of Harvard University once said when he was director of the dual bank referring to African populations. Most of them would be discardable populations. Well, what is important at this stage is to see that the workers were part, it's a long struggle to be part of the social contract so that the work becomes really the avenue for citizenship. And that's why we have seen how the civil societies in the metropolitan societies enlarges by the inclusion of the workers, but we are now entering a period of which I think the indignados and the Occupy show you very vividly is that we are entering a period of both post-contractualism and pre-contractualism. That is to say, the abandonment of the social contract and its replacement by individual contractualism <coughs> has two very different forms. The post-contractualism is the exclusion of those that were in the contract, in social contract, with rights, for instance, workers with rights, with pensions, with this and that, and they are expelled, and this expulsion is irreversible. They have no hope of getting back. <coughs> and therefore, they are post-contractual entities. The pre-contractuals are the youth to whom uh, it was promised the access to citizenship, and now it's been denied. And what is most remarkable, at least for the indignados, struggle in Europe, is that what, what they say, they did everything that it was asked for them to do, was requested. They were not vagrants, they were not uh, uh, lazy, they work a lot. They work to get through school, they try to get very good <coughs> degrees. And all of a sudden, society is blocked for them. And if they protest, they are terrorists, or they are nuts, or they are crazy, 
or they are insurgents or anarchists or whatever. So <clears throat> I think that at this level, this system, it is very important to understand that these uh, discardable populations is a constant of capitalism. But it is not an abyssal exclusion as the previous exclusions of the non-humans and the civilians. So they are different kinds of exclusions uh, going on in our system. So, if you look around now, how, what, what can we do in order to, having performed this criticism, see what other landscapes are present there? Well, if you do, in fact, uh, what I've been calling the ecology of knowledge as intercultural translation, we can see that there are much broader concepts of citizenship emerging. And these emergencies have not yet been figured out by the liberalism, and probably may never will, but it is very present and very serious and very common for many societies, probably for the majority of the people in the world. The first one is that ancestors have always been citizens in the communities. Contrary to the liberal <coughs> conceptions, ancestors are part of the communities, indigenous, peasant communities all over the world. And they decide. They are co-deciders of life. And therefore, for them, it is not really a kind of an imagination. It's a reality. And uh, I'm sure I mentioned that to some of you, the stories of my, my work in Colombia with my team in the Sierra Nevada Cucuyo, in which we were, in, in fact, having this discussion about who is going to decide about this uh, the exploitation of the oil and the starting of the oil drilling in these territories, and all the elders that were surrounding the minister of of, uh, of uh, uh, environment, the Colombian minister, uh, after a long um, discourse, a long sermon about the, the advantages of this exploitation, uh, he asked them what do you think, and they said, "Well, there was no, there was a silence. The minister got nervous, and then." Uh, later on, the, the, one of the elders, Titus, uh, raised his hand and said, yes, minister, we would very much like to, to tell you what we think about you, but we have to consult our ancestors. And the minister got a bit nervous. He said, your ancestors, I mean, your ancestors are dead. So you are here. So you have to decide yourselves. Don't be crazy. I mean, this idea of the elders, that makes you, you don't really want to decide. So we have to consult them. Well, then he asked, well, if you want to consult them, go ahead, then. consult them. And the title said, yes, we are going to consult them, but only on the full moon. Not today. Today is impossible. We have to consult it. our ancestors at a different point in time. Well, as I uh, mentioned in one of my articles on this project in Colombia the following day, all the front pages of the Colombian newspaper was that the Indians Indigenous people, the Uwes, have uh, refused to talk to the Minister of Environment. Of course, they had not refused to talk to the Minister of Environment. They had wanted to talk to him in their own terms. But they could not accept that. So you see two cultural universes here. Ancestors are alive or ancestors are dead. And you can really either ignore one or the other because they command this. So can we have a conversation around this? Yes, we can. But it has to be conducted on the idea that we have to respect the other. Even, even though you cannot agree, you cannot even sense that. You can even feel what, an, what does it mean for an ancestor to be alive. Even though it is the most everyday experience of millions and millions and millions of people in the world. The North America and North Europe are probably the, the minority in this. Second, a broader concept of citizenship, which I'm inviting you to embrace, and it is part in this paper, the, the last volume I mentioned yesterday, that is now being finished, is that, of course, nature has rights. Is the rights of nature. In fact, these rights are already consecrated in the Constitution of Ecuador and in Bolivia. And in Bolivia there is a law that says the law, the law of the Mother Earth, in which, in fact, these new conceptions of nature are there. 
I don't go into detail into the, the specifics of this, but there's another conception of nature which has nothing to do with our conception of nature, as separate from us. And we are so uh, socialized by the Cartesian distinction between body and mind that this is impossible. It's impossible for us, even though it was not obvious at the time. One of the most brilliant minds of the 17th century is uh, Spinoza. And Spinoza, working a bit later after Descartes, how stupid these these things. He has that in his ethics, in these precise words, how stupid to distinguish the mind and the body. Because one cannot exist without the other. But it was the distinction that, in fact, may became prevalent. And probably without it, it would be important, it would be impossible to have the discoveries, to have the exploitation of the natural resources, to have our palaces built with the, the gold and the silver that came from Potosi and from other mines in, the, in those places, because nature for us was res extensa, as Descartes says, that is to say, is inert, is a thing, and a thing is not a living thing. While other concepts of nature have that, of course, you can see that in Hinduism, you can see that in Buddhism, you can see that in Spinoza, you can see that in Nicolau de Cus. You have, that's why you have to know a broader tradition even in the West when you see that. And that's one asks the question, but why then this conception became so prevalent? And now you see the reason. Sociology of knowledge can tell you a lot now. And can, you, can tell you something also. And that's all of this that I'm exposing to you comes from the needs of my own work. Because in the social move, in the social forum, and in the, for instance, we are going to have now uh, three workshops of the University, the Popular University of Social Movements in Porto Alegre on January 20. And we are being together, we are being put together indigenous people, peasants, and ecologists. Because ecologists, urban, middle class, highly educated, PhDs, and so on, they understand the concept of nature as an indigenous nature. They have no problem today to understand that concept. They have been teaching themselves to see that our concept of nature is quite impoverishing for us and for nature. And they come from a very different end. Can you imagine? Now people get together, and that's what's fascinating about, about our world today, is that sometimes people imagine post-capitalism, not out of capitalism, but out of pre-capitalism. So it is really very odd for us to think, how is it possible to think something after post-capitalism if we didn't have capitalism? We have to read Marx again. Because Marx is not just the Russia case, it's the Indonesia case that we don't know much about. Uh, but it is now in the manuscript that are becoming available. Read a fabulous book by Kevin Anderson, Marx at the Margins. And you can see the fabulous notes on all these other realities. So you can see that there are different conceptions. Then uh, this is not an intellectual exercise. It is also it is intellectual, of course. But it derives from the needs of the struggles. And the needs of the struggle is that if you don't unite the movements, capitalism will divide us all. And the future is savagery. It's destruction of the planet. So you can say, is there anything in common between these guys and uh, the degrowth movement now in Europe? Or political ecology? Well, the indigenous people don't understand the growth because neither they do understand growth in that respect. Growth as infinite growth. Because they are based on conceptions of needs that we have analyzed very well in our tradition, but we ne never allow that conceptions to be dominated. Look at the, the concept of need in uh, Anahem and in Agnes Ela. You see this there. But they are not the concepts of needs that we face. So we can see that these non humans and of course you can see now that the future generation 
is becoming again, through these conversations, could become a subject of human rights. Because the symmetry collapses between rights and duties. It was constructed in a very arbitrary way. Because there is no question of my give, giving rights not to give duties for other person. This is, sounds like capitalism. What about the gift? What about solidarity? What about comp cooperativeness instead of comp competition? This tradition has always been there, but we didn't notice it. Because we read Darwin, we, are, we didn't read uh, Kropotkin. Because when Darwin was writing his book about competition, Kropotkin was writing his book about cooperation. In a British newspaper, you know, piece by piece. But of course, was out of the picture. Because of what? Because we're in the social sciences. Because we, in philosophy, we have a very narrow canon of what counts as good scholarship, as good ideas. And they are very arbitrary, very often. My example is always a, from a great literary critic, probably one of the best in our world, and a man that I admire a lot, Harold Bloom. But I can't agree with him with the 29 books that he considers to be the canon of the world. And they say, well, maybe I'll be trying, but they are the best, universally the best. Hmm. Full stop. I can't agree with that, of course. Because I see so much things being excluded, even though I have nothing against what is included. But we have been very much concerned by a canonic form of, of uh, thinking. So, if we look now at these struggles, you can see that you can amplify, in fact, the concept of citizenship and the concept of human rights. They can be widely amplified, but they have to get out of the mold of liberalism. They have to get out of the mold of capitalism. Because this nature, as a subject of rights, Moving from an anthropocentric view to an ecocentric view is an anti capitalist nature. Because it's a nature that has limits to its cycles of restoration, so cannot be run by the infinite growth. And therefore, it's anti capitalist. And that's why, for some, like my dear friend, he has been in, I think, my Colombia eco socialism, is their own view on how these things can really be theorized within a Marxist socialist, and we had that before with O'Connor, very much with the two contradictions in capital. But, you know, that's uh, our reconstruction, which up until then was kind of a debate, and now is really part of a struggle. It is amazing to see all people so different. And if you bring together, now we were recently in Dakar for the World Social Forum, and you can see that in Africa, many people, they are very much in agreement with these concepts of nature, even though they don't formulate it the same way. But uh, they are there, their own. And uh, if we go to the tribal <coughs> people in India, and we say we are talking about a few people, we are talking about at least half of the population of the world. But they are on the losing side, on the invisible side of the history. And that's why it is so difficult to to analyze that. If you look then, you can see that being uh, prepared for this hermeneutic of suspicion and that sometimes this ecology of knowledge and intercultural translation may take you to many different areas. In my, in my work, one that is, uh, that I, uh, I is assigned is in the third volume of the Versa collection is toward an intercultural conception of human rights. And in that, uh, that chapter, what I do, basically, is to try to translate interculturally the concept of human rights with the concept of Uma in Islam and the concept of Dharma in Islam. And see that all these different conceptions of human dignity are incomplete when alone. 
and even together they are not complete. But at least we raise our consciousness of the incompleteness. All of them have problems. The concept of Dharma, of course, was connected, is connected to the caste system. And there's a bias in favor of harmony. What about conflict? Conflict is important for societies. Individuals are important for society. Individuals suffer. Societies don't. But human rights, of course, has also the, the serious problem. Because it concentrates on the individual and on the rights, because our symmetry between rights and duties is a false one. In geopolitical terms and in intellectual terms, we never speak about the duties, duties of humans, human duties. We speak of human rights most of our time. Moreover, we don't see the connection between the rights and the duties. Uma, on the contrary, makes that beautifully. The duty first, the right after. But with costs. And costs may be also discriminatory. Discriminatory to the non-Muslim, discriminatory to women, according to certain interpretation of Quran. So they are incomplete, they are problematic. When I say incomplete, I mean problematic. So in our human rights, of course, are precisely incomplete because of this, our focus on the individual. As if it would be an aberration to think that our communities that produce individuals as much as individuals that produce communities. And we focus just on one of them. And it's probably wrong for that. Is there a sense of uh, some uh, tragic optimism of, out of this... Uh, type of um, discourse is not here that we have to find it. We have to find it in the struggles. And as I said, the fact that we have so much, we see so much innovation, political, social innovation around the world, we see also capitalism being rampant. We know that. The struggle is going to be more barbarian, is going to be more and more savage, in my view. I think that uh, Rosa Luxemburg that said that very, very, very well. Uh, and I was mentioning yesterday, primitive accumulation is a constant. And therefore, we are looking for virgin spaces all the time. Virgin, as she says. Well, forever the territories in Africa and Asia and so on. Now, where are they? According to Zygmunt Bauman, they were the virgin sites were the citizens that refused to be indebted, that would like to pay their bills without resorting to credit. And that has been the last uh, entity, virgin entity, to be subjected to capitalism. And there, there are some cynical guys that say that uh, Gaddafi refused totally ever to resort to credit. Others did in the past. Uh, nothing happened to them, so it's not a good argument. But you see, this is what I think that is most promising. And when we look at these questions of, and that's why I said yesterday, and I conclude, that it is important to notice the limits of the counter-hegemonic use of hegemonic instruments. But we have to be, to be radical in this sense is to exploit the limits, to the limit. Take democracy wherever it can go. Take human rights where it can go. Take the rule of law where it can go. And I see a very, very interesting phenomenon going on. And this phenomenon is that the indignados, for me, sociologically speaking, and politically speaking, the indignados and the occupied <coughs> are the sign of a beginning that has this simple characteristic. Democracy is getting out of the liberal mold. Democracy is an idea that is not in the liberal mold anymore, but doesn't have institutions adequate to that. When we compare, and in the paper I compare the struggles of the youth, and here, as we know, are not just youth, are the pre-contractualists and the post-contractualists, pensionists and others. If we compare with the struggles, the urban struggles, in Europe, in Chicago, in Paris, in Moscow, 
in Berlin at the turn of the century, they were very violent. They were bombing. They were destruction of property, even destruction of people. Today, they are peaceful, and they claim for a truthful democracy. So they want people want them to make demands. They want them to do all kinds of organizations, even though they are very well organized, even though they have no leaders. So they are already teaching us other things that are very, very difficult for the critical theory and for the critical <coughs> politics, the left politics, institutionalized up until now. They are very difficult problems, but they are there. And what is very important to me is that they have been able to put democracy beyond the liberal mold. Now, since we don't have institutions, where are the institutions? The only subaltern public spaces that you can imagine, plazas and streets. That's where they are. But they are not institutions. To begin with, they are not institutionalized. And secondly, they are illegal. They may be expelled. So they will become the institutions of the new democracy in this transitional age at the moment in which they will be strong enough to make our politici politicians come to the conclusion in Congress, in law, in Parliament throughout the world, that you are not allowed to have parks and plazas as long as people are homeless or are suffering the exclusions of this barbarian capitalism. And if we really agree on that, then probably plazas and squares will be the new institutions of democracy and will be very important ones. And probably there we'll find other forms of organization and you find other concepts and other citizens will show up. And in many communities, the past generations will be there and the future generations will be there. Even though some of them, some of us, won't see them. Thank you. So, Gay, yeah. please. In the talk yesterday, I had the sense that you were suggesting that an alternative knowledge would come out of, would have to be based almost by definition in a colonial subject. That the indigenous um, community possessed a knowledge that wasn't present in Western philosophy and that that would be the source of um, sort of new understandings. And then today, you ended up with the Occupy movements, which are much more amorphous. Much, I mean, I, at least the one in New York, the sense of individualism is like so extreme in the Occupy group. And I, so I guess I'm a little confused about where the solidarity comes from in your I, I understand that it, since it hasn't been born yet, you're not going to know exactly where it's going to come from. But there is this odd contradiction in the way you talk about indigenous knowledge as a source of alternatives, and then this other Occupy mm. stuff, which isn't indigenous and is very actually individualized in the world. Mm. Oh, it's a very good point, actually. It's, the differences are so wide, not just in cultural terms, but also in class terms, so to say. Uh, even though the class composition of the indignados may be a, also a question, particularly now, if indignados becomes a kind of a, a global movement, as it is, and as you know, there are lots of suspicions, there are lots of people that are trying to trash this uh, movement by saying that these are, uh, well, uh, some of them say that that is something that is being uh, a conspiracy of the Freedom House. Uh, you know that uh, things are, a great colleague of ours is a very, usually very intelligent, Shusotsky, and he is writing against the indignados on the idea that everything has been organized by, uh, uh, yeah, of course, of course. So all these conspiracy theories are there, Shusotsky. I have the, the, the documents there. So say that these movements are suspicious. And in fact, the guys that were trained in a peaceful type of uh, regime change, of course, is in Washington, and uh, and they were trained in Serbia, and Serbia is probably now 
the most important center for non-violent time of regime change. And they were present in Egypt, and they were present in Tunisia. Well, this conspiracy theory, may, you know, values what it values. I mean, I, they have always been there, these kinds of theories. But I'm not going to say, because I've been with indignados in Portugal and in Spain, and for sure, I don't see, even if there is, is the same argument that I mentioned yesterday vis-a-vis -vis the indigenous people. I know that there are indigenous people that are being manipulated by the, the projects of the USID, but I cannot say that all the indigenous people are puppets of the USID. They are not. And uh, we have seen in the past other stories. But you are right, they are very different realities here. What I'm saying is that the changes that are occurring in the world are coming from different directions. All of them, in a sense, are questioning <coughs> the liberal mold of politics of our modern time. And they question in cultural terms, which is uh, the indigenous movements and so on, and others in institutional terms. They are really going beyond this model. Are they going to unite? Uh, I don't know. Uh, are, should we put them together? Why do I mention that? Just to tell you, because as I told you, I'm a pragmatist. So I, I refuse to do intellectual work that has nothing to do with my concerns, with the political concerns. I think that the Indignados movement could be a second wave of the World Social Forum. I've been very active in the World Social Forum. And I'm writing a piece for inside the World Social Forum. The extent to which these indignados should be kept together in a place. And I even have already an offer by the governor of the Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre to unite all these people from 951 cities around the world. Get together for two, three, four days. So it is important for me as a rear guard theorist, not an avant-garde theorist, as an intellectual activist, to try to see these connections that may maximize this encounter. Because I think if these kids or these people, which often in fact in some, if you read the declaration, there are two declarations that are very important for us to read. The declaration here of the Occupy the Wall Street, the first one, the 29th September one, and one of the first declarations of the, the General Assembly of, 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 of Spain. Of course, the Spanish group is, is a much different and much uh, better, I would say, richer uh, movement, because it's a movement that uh, uh, originates in the neighborhoods. And in the neighborhoods, they are changing politics, real politics there. Right? For instance, for instance uh, preventing evictions. Concrete actions, concrete actions, uh, preventing, for instance, uh, uh, undocumented uh, migrant workers to be put in prison, be caught by the police, by saying no, no human being is illegal. And they have these, these posters, and they go around, wherever they see a police, when they go for these rights, they put the poster in front of the, of the migrant worker. And in fact, they have been very successful. In fact, they have not been arrested. So. It's very well organized in this respect. But of course, we are, it's, it's like the, the, the Twin Towers. I mean, lots of people there around the world, but if they die in Manhattan, it's something. I mean, it's the, Occupy Wall Street is the same. I mean, Occupy here becomes so important for the world. But I think it's happening everywhere. And I think I see that if we don't manage to connect these less uh, organic struggles with the more organic struggles of the past, it will be really difficult. So I, I share your concern, absolutely. Uh, I have no answer there. What I'm telling you is that where I think that we could move so that we don't separate these into different worlds, and if they are so different, they will never get united, and uh, capitalism deals with them separately very handsomely. I mean, it always deals with us <laughs> in a very easy way, I think. but. Uh, we have to make it difficult. I mean, the anti-capitalist struggle is to make the world more comfortable for capitalism, basically. That's my definition of anti-capitalist struggle. And if by uniting them, uh, this is possible, then I think we have accomplished something. I'm 
holding back temporarily. <laughs> well, what? There's a question over here. Yeah. Oh. So it's interesting going back to the conversation you were having with Eric yesterday, um, and then putting that as the backdrop for what you just said about uniting um, efforts. Um, how does it work? Is it are we trying to, in a sense, come up with um, a kind of a blanket that can cover things and then let us move in different directions? Um, and and is that not then? Um, taking away the particularities of context in how people struggle? Well, that's precisely the, the, that's a good question, but that the, the idea of uh, the, uh, the intercultural translation, which is, which is my proposal against general theory or universal theories, is that you have to develop mutual intelligibility without cannibalizing ideas. So the idea is not to destroy the diversity of the other, is to make more intelligible the differences. And for that, you have to start from a conversation that not allows you to put yourself in a position in which the other is always in the wrong foot, always in the wrong part of the discourse, always in the wrong part of the argument, always in the wrong part of history. So, Because at, at that level, you cannot have a conversation, quite frankly. People don't tolerate that anymore unless they need your money, but not if they need just your ideas. So, uh, my, that would be my answer. Uh, I really liked uh, your thoughts on the um, incompleteness of each of these historically specific uh, sort of rights conceptions that have been embedded in different traditions, <clears throat> that each is incomplete uh, because each triggers different kinds of trade-offs and deficits. Um, and that even putting them all together is incomplete, you said. Mm -hmm. Now, the first part is a clearer claim than the second part. Because it isn't so obvious that the complementarities and possible, you know, to use an older term, syncretisms, that mm -hmm. is the mutual modification that comes through the translation. So I agree with, of course you don't want to cannibalize. I mean, the word cannibalize suggests mm -hmm. kind of violence. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean you don't want mutual modification to come through the dialogue. That is, so that you end up with something different from where you start in each part. And then it's not so obvious that the whole necessarily re remains incomplete, at least in the same sense that the individual traditions are incomplete. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly if the intercultural translation is taken you know, in the really serious way you're proposing, as symmetrical dialogue rather than pro forma ritualistic exchange. Mm -hmm. um, and at least as an aspirational idea. I mean, in, there's a kind of trivial sense in which it's incomplete, because everything has to be incomplete. Right, that, but that's, right. you're meaning something mm -hmm. different, yeah. different, more serious than that. Yeah. I, think. Yeah. Uh, I think the aspirational idea that all of these different notions of rights and it's sort of the foundational problem of justice and suffering that, and what to do about it. They're all trying to tap into a similar human space of problems, but in these different <coughs> situated ways. And that the dialogue might actually produce a synthesis that has, mm -hmm. that's less, that's not just less incomplete in the way all the others were incomplete, mm -hmm. but it's really something new. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, I understand your, your point quite, uh, quite well, uh, uh, Eric. And uh, uh, what is my, my response? The first one is that <clears throat> whenever something uh, uh, can be called complete, what do I gain by that? Basically, if you are in a conversation like this, intercultural translation, the completeness issue raises the same problems as the issue of truth. Because if something, there is a contradiction between being the truth and being provisionally the truth. Well, exactly here. So it's always incomplete in the sense that these dialogues are very fragile. I mean, these articulations are fragile. Because sometimes in a dialogue in, among movements, one leader says something that offends the other and the dialogue goes down the drain. 
So the idea that everything is, irre uh, is reversible is, is what concerns me most. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the completeness of it would be inadequate, in my view, for this purpose. The second one has to do with that, uh, since there is no quantity that I can imagine as complete, the more incompletely I know, the, the, the wider the incompleteness is. That is to say, this is applying to these questions the Socratic principles. You know, the more I know, the more I know that I don't, I don't know. That's also the, the principle of the learned ignorance of Cusanos, Nicolaus de Cusa. That is to say, the more we know, the more we know that we don't know. Therefore, one, one issue, and just to give you a, a very concrete example again from the struggle. If when we are at these uh, 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 workshops of the popular university, of the social movements, do you know what is our last question of uh, the third day? Who was missing here? Who we didn't invite? And uh, Eric is the most fascinating part of the, the workshops. When people that they felt privileged because they were here and they thought after this celebration and drinking and dancing and discussing, and we didn't bring. Who, who was absent and should be here with us? And the long list of movements, organizations come in that you couldn't imagine. So, again, by bringing them together, we raised the incompleteness. They were not aware of those because they were. In fact, being integrated, the part of the articulation. But once there and once in favor, in view of the discussions, they see how many people could have benefited. We miss this and that and that. If you go to our webpage, you can even see, in the, I think in the Belo Horizonte meeting, uh, there is a full list of the movements that should have come. Uh, the people, you know, we just collect the list that people are saying. Well, this was here, there, and so on, and the travestis, for instance. Uh, that, that they were not included and said, but travestis would have been a very fundamental contribution to some of our debates like this. You know? So, rising the, the incompleteness, that's my, that's my, my topic. Heinz. Paul, well, I, I think I understand the conversation we're having with respect to the, the incomplete, the, the kind of intercultural discussion we want to have on one side. There's the liberal and there is those that have been excluded. What about the anti-liberal? What about the fact that in the world today we face possible forces that are coming together that would not just stomp on the marginalized, they'd stomp on the liberal as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how, where does our critical analysis enable us to do that work at the same time that we're doing this work? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very important question. I mean, we, uh, when I say that we are entering a post-institutional world, uh, I always think that the post-institutionalism can be uh, a weapon for the oppressed, but also for the powerful. Uh, that's how I see the struggle today. Of course, there are many, even many people that have been trying to make some comparisons between the Occupy and the Tea Party. I think similarities, I think that after all, they are claiming that all against the state, they are against the Congress, they are against corruption, they are, they are the same. But are they the same? You know, I think for most people they are not the same, right? Because ones are in favor of, of the 99% while the others are in favor of the 1%. Put as simply. No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, that's simplifying it too much, right? Because I know, there, there I know. are people who are of the Tea Party or at Wall Street because they are also against the 1%, but maybe against a few others as well. Um, but the, it would be nice even no, if more but, people would come. But I'm asking you not about that. Again, you, you slip back to the mo social movements and, the, and maybe mm. an illiberal social movement. But what about the illiberal forces that are actually in power? No, look, uh, they're actually in power. Well, we have to distinguish that all these concepts that we developed uh, and in the struggle, there is no insurance against perversion. The new insurance that our weapons cannot be used by the enemies. And therefore, the discourses, we have no property on the things that we use. Uh, just, uh, uh, just to give you an example of the, of the civil society in, in the Weimar uh, uh, Republic. 
What was the civil society? Very strong. But all of it against democracy. And even the political scientists of this country developed a very important concept called the bad civil society. And there is a study by a colleague of ours from Princeton here that he identified that uh, one of the key members in Gestapo was part of 70 NGOs of these civil society organizations against democracy. So am I going to be against civil society organizations and NGOs? I cannot. So what we have to do is that, in fact, these are the states, I'm talking about the ones that are in power, out of power, but they want to get to power. In the end, they came to power through Hitler, of course, right? So the struggles are there, of course, vis-a-vis -vis those that are in power. My idea is, well, that's my idea, and I say my idea is that my, as I look at all these days, is that we had for a long time been theorizing in, the, in political theory the idea that we have a crisis of representation and a crisis of, uh, of participation. For some, is the pathology of representation and pathology of participation because the first one, we don't feel represented by the represented, our representatives, and secondly, why participate because they will do whatever they want and I don't vote and abstention and so on. I think that's what I'm thinking now. Uh, is 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 already in this paper, but is is, is still in a very draft form. Is that this um, discrepancy, this pathology of representation, as a, a certain threshold beyond which enough is enough, and participation may rise. You see, if the 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 the, the separation between my aspirations for my representative and what they represent, because they are not being elected by the millions of people, but by millions of dollars, then all of a sudden, I think I have to participate. How do I participate? In the only subaltern public spheres that are left to me, the plazas and the streets, peacefully. And of course, we can move from there. We can move, for instance, there are people that are already thinking that, in fact, if you want to crush uh, financial mm -hmm. capital, we have to go, and uh, I'm giving you names of serious people, like uh, Zygmunt Mauman, for instance, is that we should try to design strategy of decreasing for the families, new parties or new movements in order to reduce our access to credit. That is to say because we have come to the conclusion that it is never payable credit that is the largest source of, of, of profit is for the financial market. And that's why we are punished if we pay our bills. So, can we create a movement of this type? I mean, it's difficult to see that. And there, there are issues, Heinz. That's, that's the interesting thing, because you are right. Nothing in theory is pure. But we have litmus tests. If you are going to organize a movement against credit cards, for instance, let's see, are the Tea Party as enthusiastic as they are the occupies? Let's do maybe, maybe a wrong litmus test. But you have to see a litmus test, we have to perform these litmus tests for one very simple reason. Which side are you on? And you have to decide that. And, and the people decide in one way or the other. And there is very, we have to find the issues that force people to decide which side they are on. Up until then, everything is vague. And they have to gather everything as celebration. But there are things in which you don't celebrate together because you are really against the, uh, these things. So I, I, I think you're right. I mean, that's, that's one of the conditions of our time. We don't have a, a, a right strategy, a right dogma. We don't have a central party <laughs> who tells us what to do. So we are a bit lost, but I think that's why we are more creative. I think. Yeah, please. Uh, I have a question about the categories of the post-contractual and pre-contractual. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to make sure I understand this correctly. You describe the indignados as post-contractualists, as the people who have been shoved out of the far end of the system in the historical spectrum. No, I, actually, I, I said the opposite. I said the majority of them, the young people, are the pre-contractualists. The ones that were promised access to citizenship. Okay. That is to say, what is citizenship in this concept is work with rights. Okay. 
That was the, 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 the avenue for the social call for workers, is work with rights. So these people are not having access to this form of citizenship because they are unemployed. They are sometimes they are too skilled to be employed. And if they get some employment, they have no rights. They cannot sign any contract. For instance, one of the things that we are analyzing in the labor studies today in Europe, based on this experience of very good colleagues at the Rosa Luxembourg Foundation in Berlin, is how the distinction between paid and unpaid labor is fading away. There is no, even the hours of work and hours of leisure, that we knew already. But the paid and unpaid, and in fact there was a visitor here some time ago that was already addressing these issues. So these, are the, so these young people are the pre-contractual. They will never enter the social contract. What I'm saying is that some people look at the picture and say, but they are elderly people there. There are people there that, of course, they are the post-contractuals. And they're not very old. They are 50 years old. They had a very good employment. They were fired. And now they are too old to be employed again, even though they are in the, the apex of their, their energies. But they are not considered fit for the employment for any kind of employment. So these irreversible uh, uh, expulsions is what is called post-contractualism because they were inside and now are out. But there are others they will never be let in. So in my view is that the social contract was from the beginning more exclusion than inclusion. But the liberal theory was more credible because still there were social movements that managed to bring, in fact, real inclusion, particularly the women, was remarkable, and the workers. Now we see more people being excluded, and they don't see the people being included. More people are being excluded. So exclusion processes take precedent over precedence over inclusion processes, and that's the crisis of a given system. Is that? Let me, let me rephrase it. Um, you had described the Occupy and the Indignados movements in the developed world, and then the uh, various movements of indigenous peoples around the world. And I think I had confused that with post contractual and pre contractual. Yeah. No. But I think my question still, depressingly enough, um, makes sense. And that is, in my thinking, what is so frustrating to me is it seems like the two groups, um, the half of the world you described, who are being left out, the indigenous peoples, for lack of a better mm -hmm. and the indignados, are so often at cross purposes that capitalism, you know, sets them at cross purposes. And so <coughs> increasingly we have a uh, discourse here and in, in Europe about losing our jobs. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how something like the Occupy movement and a movement of indigenous peoples in Latin America could ever really get together for that because of this. Mm -hmm. that, that's, um, that's another very excellent point and a very practical one. We fight precisely at this point in Europe in this respect when we see that for many workers and trade unions, in fact, the immigrants, and usually they are Arab immigrants in most of cases, or Turks or, or whatever, they are taking away their jobs. And some of them are indigenous. In fact, from Ecuador and Bolivia, most of them are indigenous people, and some of them are going back to their countries. So it is true. I mean, these tensions are there. And, and I'm not saying that they are not there. On the contrary, the point would be, uh, there is to say the opposite point would be to say that the Occupy movement has no progressive role to play in the world as the world. May be good for the United States, may be good for, for, for Europe, but probably it's going to worsen yeah. the lives of the people in Africa and Latin America and so on. The question is open. I guess in Quite this frankly, sense, I don't know how to respond there. Could be. I guess in this sense, the whole labor movement in the developed world, in the trade union movement, is just as guilty of the same kind of exclusion 
as you describe liberal social theory mm -hmm. for me. Because union unionization and organized labor was always tied to having a particular job in the developed world, um, the rest of the world was left out mm -hmm. and more or less didn't exist. And you know, I, I, I hope for a new wave of labor organizing in this coming century that will correct that kind of original sin. You have a point there, except that uh, uh, if the workers uh, that were oppressed and got some rights are the, they themselves as oppressors as the multinational corporations, and I can go along with you, of course, uh, because uh, they, they have been oppressed in the system, and you have new labor internationalism. For instance, one volume in, in my verso uh, uh, volume is dedicated to what I call the new labor internationalism. There are lots of initiatives today among labor unions, even there is a movement in Brazil, it calls the, the citizenship movement of, within the labor movement, in which the labor movement unites, there is a specialist here, that's Gay Simon, unites with citizenship issues, not labor issues, and they are very much in connection with contradiction with South Africa, or now with India, and so on. So uh, I think that we see connections for interaction that are very much there, but I cannot deny the tensions, for instance, the tensions now in Bolivia between the miners and the indigenous people, because the miners wanted a job in the mines, and the indigenous people want to defend their territories. We have a contradiction, uh, what <coughs> Mao Zedong used to say, the secondary contradiction, because it's within the people, right? Uh, but these contradictions are very serious. And in fact, the government decided, but for you to see how unstable the situation, the class alliances are today, is that the government decides with the miners. At a given point, the indigenous react and then they suspend the measure. So it is really a kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to analyze, which is the state also over the above, in a sense. The, a class struggle is suspended in very specific ways and comes down in this way, but doesn't work, come out in a, def a different way. It is very unstable, the situation. But the indigenous people are well organized and enough organized to make a difference in this respect. They have mm -hmm. What is uh, the struggle now? Is the dialogues between, in case of Bolivia, between the SSTCUB, it's a, 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 a horrible acronym, are the workers and the miners, and the Konamak, and the, 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 the CIDOL, the two indigenous movements, and, uh, and, uh, and the, the workers. And they have been part of a pact of unidad, a unity pact. Uh, but then they, they really got divided on this issue. And then there are the women, very well organized in Bolivia, called the Bartolina Cisnes, a great leader, uh, from some time ago. Uh, and they were also a bit ambivalent between the indigenous struggle and the peasant struggle. So these are contradictions, but social processes are messy. I mean, th these are the kind of processes you have to deal with, and uh, you, you are always running the risk that uh, Heinz uh, was telling us. I mean, you may be think that I'm doing the most progressive thing, and all of a sudden it turns out to be very retrogressive. I mean, but what is the alternative? Paralysis. Right? And we don't allow ourselves to be paralyzed. Um, I agree with your discussion of how liberal rights reasoning relies on excluding certain types of people or non people. Um, but in the description of, of the discussion between the environmental minister in Colombia and the indigenous groups, it got me to thinking about um, the way in which liberal rights reasoning uh, legitimates looking to ancestors in a certain way when it comes to legal precedent and stare decisis. And that to say to a liberal, you can't go and consult your ancestors, it seems in some way that's what courts are always doing. And how is that different? Well, it's not different. I mean, uh, <laughs> cultural domination is, is, is what exists in these societies. I mean, the we know that the national cultures in these societies were a very partial type of conceptions of nation, of, of national culture. Mm -hmm. 
was the legal culture. But it's so why legal pluralism was accepted only much later. I mean, the legal pluralism comes into the constitutions very recently. And I think the first constitution is the Constitution of Colombia, 1991. Not even the Constitution in, uh, of Brazil in 1988. We have in Africa, of course, a great tradition. We have colleagues here that are very competent in that on legal pluralism in Africa. But uh, now we have already, uh, in, for instance, in these cases that you are mentioning, we have, for instance, the, the Constitutional Court in, in Colombia, with very interesting type of jurisprudence, as we would call them, intercultural, of intercultural nature. What is it to say, just to give an example, on, uh, on due process, whether the presence of a lawyer or the presence of uh, an elder of the, the, the community are functionally equivalent uh, for a given case. That's a good example of intercultural jurisprudence. So you don't stick to the code, we stick to the cultural e equivalent uh, of what the role that the, the lawyer is supposed to, to play. Um, in your reference to the conception of rights as extending to future generations or past generations, on future generations, it's easy to think about ways in which the implications of a current decision impacts future lives can be fully part of the current dialogue about what should be done. So you have a set of trade-offs to face in deciding some kind of resource allocation, and it's being done in a, in a democratic, deliberative manner. Uh, and the issue of, OK, we thought a lot about how this affects different communities now, but we have to think also about how it affects future generations. So the taking due consideration of the impact on future generations would be one way of playing out that idea, yeah. that that future generation has rights. The notion that the past generations have rights as opposed to wisdom, but as I understand the idea that we want to consult either through our memories of how people in the past thought about these things, or through our dreams, or whatever, whatever the protocol is for how you do that. I understand what it would mean to tap the wisdom. I don't quite know what it means to tap the rights. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. even <laughs> that is using the same word, rights, to apply to these different categories, as opposed to saying, we have to take due consideration of perspectives from all sorts of sources, one of which is ancestors. Mm -hmm. But the, that seems like a case where the language of rights, that word has such status in the current debates that it's being appropriated for, for rhetorical purposes, rather than that it's actually capturing what's going on. Well, you, 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 you are right. I mean, it, it's always when we have a kind of a, a mold and the, and, the, and the context for a given concept and try to extrapolate, we always face this problem. But look, um, there are in fact struggles uh, going on today that are based on the idea, could be considered as ways of being uh, conceived as idea of the rights of past generation. And even they are called historical justice. Truth and conciliation commissions. The Durban meeting against the crimes of colonialism in fact, in a sense, I, I don't, uh, I, maybe other thing, maybe wisdom, maybe whatever, but it is not so far out to consider that in order to get historical justice, you have to concede rights that other generations have for their struggles. They were defeated, but they were unjustly so. so I think that today, and the same in a sense, not for the distant part, uh, the distant past is of course the anti-slavery and the, you know, and the, the compensation for slavery and so on and so forth. I'm not caring about that now. The Truth and Conciliation Commissions now, that are, are really going very strong now uh, in, EU, in, in, in Latin America. For instance, now Brazil is trying really to bring to court all these, uh, all these generals. He are the rights of the dead. <laughs> Uh, are the rights of the dead? They are past generations, yes. I mean, they struggle 
uh, their struggle was uh, made visible by the very nature of the transition, because the transition in Brazil was uh, a pacted, uh, you know, a negotiated transition, in the terms of which there would be no crimes uh, uh, for the, you know, the dictatorship would have never committed any crimes, no, no crimes indictments. And people say this is unconstitutional, it's against the Geneva Convention. And that's why that was the same basis for Pinochet. Mm -hmm. So I see a point there. I see a point there. I, I was, spe was specifically the invocation of consulting that I understand that mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. historical rights, redress of historical injustice, bringing to, to trial the perpetrators of crimes that happened in the past. But the example you gave was of the elders saying we have that we, the reason for consulting in the, in the meaning that they give for consultation, the elders, is because of the rights of the, I mean, the ancestors, as opposed to the wisdom of the ancestors. No, in those, in those cases, I don't think it's the right. No, okay, no, in that, that case, you use, oh yeah, in that case, no. No, no I, that's, that's what I'm I sorry, no, no. Yeah. In that case, is, is, they are uh, really looking, it's not because the ancestors are imposing, right. it's because they, their wisdom is right, so right. fundamental. Yeah, so that's that. Yeah, no, no, that's so clear. It's because you used the word rights in that yeah. context that I wasn't sure what. Probably it was my mistake, yeah. yeah. But in terms of trusts or estates or, or in wills, the ancestors do have rights. Right, and I was just, re it was only because of the using that term to justify the consultation bill. Yeah. That's yeah. the part that didn't. But the liberal tradition does it in that form. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not so. It's, it's easier. It's not so rare. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's also not. It's not clear to me that that whether it's a right or a consultation to past or future, it's necessarily emancipatory. <laughs> and this may be another case of you know these are tools and they may be used by your enemies. Mm -hmm. But it's possible to consult or give rights to past and future and have unjust outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about the conceptions of those that should be included in the conversation. Mm -hmm. We are not talking about the results of the conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, as, as I was explaining, we have the bad civil society. I mean, it's good to have civil society, probably, but uh, that civil society, in fact, wasn't the source of Nazism. So, I mean, the one advantage of um, the, the living generation as being at the center is you can talk to each other and democratic dialogue and reasonableness, mm -hmm. not reason, but reasonableness can, can transform people's views. Mm -hmm. You can't, in the same sense, consult future generations uh, and have them, you can, Simulate it, but you don't directly consult them in dialogue, and you know. And therefore, it's more manipulable. There are lots of people in the world for whom it is easier to consult and to talk to the ancestors right. than to talk to the neighbor, because sometimes neighbors are not there.